I'm producing this video as a response to the public policy exchange debate yesterday and the new issues that were raised. It doesn't matter if you didn't watch the debate as the subjects are probably well known to you and each one can be dealt with in its own right. As expected, the audience of about 25, not including the speakers, was a listless bunch, mostly from the public sector who spent the entire morning whinging about lack of dentists and lack of funding. This is a feature of dental groups and most other groups, I would imagine. When they get together, they just talk about how things aren't what they used to be and expound on what needs to happen and what they would like to see happen without making any decent suggestions about how this could be achieved. This is what sets the achievers apart from the whingers, the ability to actually make change happen. Some suggestions were made. One was the introduction of some sort of seniority pay to enhance the earnings of practitioners as their productivity drops off. I think the person who suggested this was probably old enough to remember that this was tried before. Younger practitioners had their fees top sliced to pay older practitioners and it wasn't voluntary. You paid in expectation of getting the money back, not from a fund, but from the future tax on younger practitioners. When the time came to pay increasingly more of it back, the scheme was scrapped, the cupboard was bare. Younger practitioners had been ripped off, all trust was lost, and there would be no support for a new version of this. Another suggestion was to increase the incentive to go into the NHS by writing off student debt. Now I don't agree with charging students to go to university and lending them money to pay those charges. It just inflates the tuition costs and is a direct subsidy to the universities, not the students. When they graduate, they pay back more than the cost of their education in taxes, so in effect they pay for it twice. It is in society's interest to encourage people to be highly trained because they contribute more both financially and in civic development. Writing off debt is inflationary and any obligation to work on the NHS for say three years post-graduation wouldn't work. This is because graduate dentists already spend some time working within the NHS before going private, so you'd be paying them to do something that they do already. Also, as a general principle, I don't think this should apply to dentists since all graduates are trained at the state's expense. Why don't architects spend three years working for public bodies or accountants or vets? The whole idea is silly. Much better to abolish student fees and loans and pay a flat rate subsidy and force universities to attract graduates in the free market based on performance. Another suggestion was to give dentists the skills to extract wisdom teeth free of charge so that more work could be done in primary care. But the reason that dentists don't extract wisdom teeth is not because they don't have the skills, they just don't have the support. Viewers of this channel may remember that my first complaint was from a woman who said that she had experienced pain and discomfort following a wisdom tooth extraction. The dentist on the panel said the tooth had been covered with bone. I knew he was looking at the external oblique ridge, which appears on an x-ray as if it covers the third molar, but I didn't feel confident enough to argue with him. The panel found in the patient's favour because their expert dentist said I was lying about whether or not the tooth was covered in bone. At that point, I vowed never to extract another third molar and for 40 years I never did. They all went into secondary care, now called level two, at great public expense. Recently, a patient of ours was awarded £8,000 because we failed to diagnose a felling for six months. The law states that if you make a mistake, it's negligence. There's nothing short of negligence in law, therefore all dentistry is now defensive. You don't do anything or accept any patient that may present a management problem. This is, diff this is different if you are a salaried consultant in a hospital. There, the presumption is that you are a wise head, and if something goes wrong, it's because you get all the difficult cases. In general practice, the presumption is that you attempted to do something that was beyond your skills, probably because you were greedy for money and got into trouble and deserved to have the book thrown at you and to get you back in line. This attitude is prevalent at the General Dental Council and also within the training hospitals where student dentists and hygienists are warned that once they get into general practice, they will inevitably come under heavy pressure to do things in a way that produces maximum profit rather than maximum health and to resist all and any advice from experienced practitioners unless they want to get struck off. You could offer me a four week all expenses course in the Maldives on extracting wisdom teeth and I would attend, but once I came back to Blighty, I wouldn't take any out. 
It was suggested that dentists should use fee for item to fix patients' teeth before they are accepted onto capitation. And this was the difference between private capitation, which works, and public capitation, which is a form of supervised neglect. But that is not the difference. You can be accepted onto a private capitation plan without having any of your outstanding work carried out. It's just that that treatment will not be done on the plan. The difference is that on private capitation schemes, the fee is set by the dentist and the patient, and by definition is always adequate. Whereas with public capitation plans, the fee is set by the state and is always inadequate. Giving the dentist the ability to charge an inadequate fee to remediate dental disease and barring patients from a state plan with inadequate capitation fees until they have had that treatment will not work. Another trick is to set up a dental school in a deprived area based entirely on the assumption that graduates will practice in that area because by the time they qualify they will have got used to it and ignore its reputation for being a shithole. This is an extension of the policy of recruiting abroad by telling non-UK dentists that they are being sent to a paradise with warm sandy beaches while clutching a ticket to Jaywick or Blackpool. These dentists are not stupid, they know they are going to shitholes. They also know that the shitholes they are going to are probably better than the radioactive shitholes they are coming from. Setting up a dental school is an expensive variation on this policy, which creates a bunch more deans, professors, etc. It's OBEs all round and the public finances be damned. In any case, it's no use running the taps if the plug's not in the bath. One thing that is never mentioned is our failure to deliver prevention. The profession adopts a means-based approach which consists of throwing hygienists, electric toothbrushes, magic brushing methods, TP brushes, toothpaste, floss and mouthwashes at patients to little or no effect. Patients don't know what they're cleaning off their teeth, they have never seen plaque, they don't know where it is and they don't know when it's gone. It's not uncommon for me to have a new patient who says that they have got every dental aid under the sun and spend a lot of time cleaning their teeth every day for me to find after staining up their teeth that their efforts are completely ineffective and I advise them to throw the contents of their bathroom cabinet out of the window and use disclosing tablets and a 30 pay toothbrush. We teach an ends based approach. If you can get rid of your plaque, I don't care how you do it. We get good results, but we are in the minority because we don't need the ego boost that comes from thinking that patients rely on you to have a healthy mouth. All that's needed for prevention is some disclosing tablets and a cheap toothbrush, not some £250 Procter & Gamble electric toothbrush with a linear magnetic drive and its own app. The former chief dental officer said that the problem was that dentists are queuing up to join the National Health Service, but there is a bottleneck in getting NHS numbers. He said that he is very optimistic that fluoridation can be introduced due to changes in the legislation and with a bit more funding, success is guaranteed. He also thinks that the NHS is overburdened, remediating problems with treatment that is carried out in the private sector. My opinion is that the private sector is overburdened, remediating problems with treatment that is carried out in the public sector. But Mr Cockcroft made it clear that he frowns upon anyone in A&E who has had a stroke while on a private operating table, even though that patient will have paid national insurance and be entitled to NHS treatment and may have saved the NHS money by going privately in the first place. One of the speakers was from Dentaid. They present an interesting problem. Why should an organisation that was set up to provide dentistry in third world countries be operating in the UK? They said that their patients include immigrants, the homeless and areas where there are no dentists. I thought the NHS was set up so that these groups could have access to healthcare. I'm in favour of healthcare being provided philanthropically or through charities, but to have to pay for the NHS and then let them abrogate their responsibility to provide health care to underserved communities means that they can have their cake and eat it. One of the issues that is never discussed is patient responsibility. Whenever a patient is paraded on the local news recounting how they had to pull their own teeth out, it's assumed that they looked after their mouth to a high standard and were the victim of a random disease or decay and had no choice but to reach for the pliers. In practice, these people have advanced gum disease caused by years of neglect. They are irregular attenders at best who budget day to day and then one day they are standing in front of the local news cameras 
saying that they pulled their own teeth out. As a dentist I can tell you it's not that easy to pull teeth out unless they are swinging around like the clapper on a bell. But there have always been people who pulled their own teeth out even when NHS dentistry was readily available. People have pulled their own teeth out since people have had teeth. The nurses of course were saying that they were underpaid and their skills are unappreciated. This is a constant refrain from ancillary workers who fail to realise that people are paid exactly what they're worth based on the three factors of recruitment, retention and motivation identified by the pay review bodies. To be highly paid you have to be useful, highly skilled and scarce. Wages find their own level in the free market. Nurses were not helped by nurse registration. They are a low risk group and work under the direct personal supervision of a dentist who is registered with the GDC. Registration was a vanity project led by the nurses leader Pam Swain. They were welcomed into the GDC family with open arms. Although they don't pay much, they are the biggest craft group by far, so they represented a big increase in the size of the empire and funding. Indemnity groups jumped on the nurses, telling them they needed indemnity insurance. But after a few years, they had so few cases, they were scratching around for nurses to claim to support a need for their insurance. In the meantime, nurses were complaining to all and sundry about the cost of registration and indemnity and who would pay it for them. Whether they pay it themselves, which puts the wages bill up, or whether the practice pays it for them, either way, it gets passed on in higher patient charges. Now you might be watching this and thinking, do you know what, this makes perfect sense. Old Angry has made a good and very logical case for his model of public health provision. Surely sense will prevail. If so, I've got some bad news for you. My views are increasingly in the minority. The regulatory system has been captured by and is a cash cow for the lawyers and the political and administrative system is populated and directed by people who are sucking on the state teat. They are like a cancer and the only solution for them is more money and greater power and it's getting worse. The titans of health provision that formed the bulk of the speakers couldn't finish on time despite being told they only had 20 minutes. Half of them couldn't log on to the meeting so it started late. Some of them couldn't share their presentations because they couldn't share their screens. When they started talking, one of them couldn't see his own presentation. They didn't realise they were on camera and started doing yoga. One couldn't line her camera up, so she gave the presentation while we were looking at the top of her head. I wouldn't put these people in charge of a tea urn, let alone a multi-million pound essential service. Yet it was all done in a sense of shared suffering. You're having problems with the technology? We sympathise. Things are going wrong in your department? We know how you feel. We're all working hard to make the best of a bad job. Everything would be alright if only we could have a little more money from the government. Attempts to explain that the UK is in a debt spiral so serious that the government has delayed the autumn statement in the hope that, as Wilkins Micawber would say, something will turn up, fell on heads that were both deaf and dumb. I'm going to reserve my closing comments for the NHS dentist who shall remain nameless. Three of his more ludicrous quotes were The UDA system can work if you have a dentally fit patient base. Dentists could stay in the NHS if they really wanted to. And I am very happy with the quality of my work. My NHS standards and my private standards are the same. This was after admitting sometimes he has to wait an hour to go to the toilet if he's really busy. Here, in full flow, was the arrogance of youth. Here was a legend in his own bathtub. Someone who has the energy and is prepared to sacrifice his quality of life to work on the NHS. With the arrogance to think that he's found the solution that most other dentists have missed. That he is a success in a sea of failure. When he grows up a bit, he will realise that any system works if the patients are already dentally fit. And dentists who leave don't want to stay on the NHS because perhaps their standards are higher than his. Everybody is happy with their own standards, however appalling they are. And if your private treatment is the same as your NHS treatment, then I feel sorry for your private patients. I made the same challenge to him that I make to all so-called successful NHS dentists. I will visit him at my own expense 
and if he is providing a high quality comprehensive NHS service to all, I will go public and admit that my last 40 years have been wasted and everyone should go back on the NHS, which he accepted. His boss immediately came on the line and said, hold on a minute, we need to know what your de definition is of high quality. As soon as you hear that, you know they have lost the moral high ground. I doubt if I will go and embarrass him any further, Perhaps I will just make a quick phone call and say that I am a new NHS patient and I need a chrome denture and a scan and polish with a dentist. And when can they fit me in? It might save a lot of trouble. Thanks for listening and come back soon.